Hello and welcome to Victory Life Church. We are so glad you have tuned in today. We have a special word for you that we know will bless your life. Now, prepare your heart and your mind as you receive all that God has for you. Mark chapter 4, I started a series a few weeks ago, and I say I started a series, I really believe it was the timing of the Lord. I believe that He's the one that leads me. I know I'm not the perfect vessel, and there's things I can get wrong, but uh, I really believe this was where God was leading us. And the title of this message is Panicked or Resting, because Mark chapter 4 gives us those two things happening at the same time. At the end of Mark chapter 4, uh, we read in verse 35, And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. So Jesus is talking to his disciples. They're going to leave and go to a different place. In fact, that's what that phrase, let us go over to the other side, that phrase is in the Greek, let us go to a different place. And I believe that throughout your life, God calls you to go to a different place. And it's not just to go to one place and you stay there. And these places can be physical. It could be occupational, but it's also spiritual where you do grow. You're called to a place of growth. You're called to a level of growth. And then as you ex explore that level and now it's time to move on, there's a calling that, to go to a different place, to move up higher. And God is such a gentleman and by His Spirit, He's calling you to do this. And it's our job to answer. God can't force you. He's not going to, uh, you know, program you like a robot and make you do it. But he's asking us to go to a different place. And in verse 36, when they had s sent away the multitudes, they took him even when he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. So it wasn't just Jesus in the boat with the disciples. There were other ships following or going on this journey to a different place. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish, or don't you care that we die? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. So he rebuked the wind that was causing the storm, and then spoke to the seas that were affected by the wind, peace, be still. And when he, or and he said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, what manner of man is this, that the wind and the sea Obey him. And so some points that I made a few weeks ago is that the devil doesn't want you going to a different place. And I think one of the reasons why this message is timely is because I think God's calling us to go to a different place than we have been the last year and a half. There is such a pressure on us to adopt a new norm. And that is not God. This norm that the world's wanting us to conform to is not God. God doesn't lead with pressure. God doesn't lead us with control and mandates and so forth. That's not the leading of the Lord. God does not lead with fear. It's not how God leads us. God leads us by His Spirit. And I said this morning that the love of God casts out 
all fear. So you could say love and fear are counter, opposites. So God is leading us by His Spirit, not circumstances, not situations. And I say this, not even jobs. I talked about this a little bit last week. But too many times we get led by the financial arena. And I'm all for you prospering, and I know God is too. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and it adds no toil to it. God teaches His children how to profit. God takes pleasure in the prosperity of His servant. Beloved, I wish above all that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. That's all Scripture. You can't read the book of Proverbs and not come out with a belief that God wants you to prosper. God wants you to succeed. But the will of God is where you find that. And that's what I'm going to actually go into in the next level here after the first of the year is the fact that when you get into God's plan, it's already blessed. What we do is we try to come up with our own plans and then ask God to bless it. But there's already a blessed plan for every one of your lives. I don't care if you're Ty's age and you're in high school still, if you're Blake's age and you're just a baby, which I don't get to hold her because everybody steals her for service. So I called the little break baby mine. So when the break baby comes, hands off, I get that one. <laughs> <laughs> Adeline already calls me grandpa. <laughs> Adeline Brake calls me grandpa. So, <laughs> and I love it. I love it. It's, I think God's having her help me get ready because, you know, I'm not that far away from being a grandpa. I mean, <laughs> my daughters have to get married first, but, you know, I'm calling those things that be not. I'm looking into the future. I can't wait. Can't wait. So, again, God's plan for your life is already blessed. He's already worked out the kinks. He already has everything set. And it's beautiful. And when you walk out that plan, you live in this blessing. Because it's already blessed. It's not a works thing. It's that this is already prepared. It's already blessed. And so don't be concocting your own plans and, how, and strategizing on how you're going to get ahead in this. You're better off just allowing God to lead you and to just be in His constant care as a child is with the Father. So the storm, the second point I made a few weeks ago is that the storm is intended to stop forward progress. So they were going from point A to point B across the lake, right? Then came a storm. They were not able to continue moving forward. The intent of the storm from the enemy in your life is to stop your forward progress. So some of you are facing a storm right now. One thing you can take heart in is that you must be going forwards. You must be moving. Now, the storm is not what we're led by. And that's unfortunate when people do that. They think, well, I have this problem happen, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, so I must not be in God's will. Were the disciples? Or I should say, was Jesus? Of course he was. He was in the boat. Jesus only did what the Father told him to do. He only said what the Father told him to say. So Jesus was in the boat, and yet there was a storm. And like I said, the title of this message is Panicked or Resting. The disciples were panicked. They said, Jesus, don't you care? We are dying. We're dead. We're dead meat, Jesus. Now, that's one thing fear does, is it gets you to focus on the wrong thing, and you overreact, you overcorrect, you don't think logically. 
Because the, they, the boat was full of water, but they weren't dead. They weren't even sinking. The boat was just full. They believed, though, through the process that 2 plus 2 equals 4, that, hey, it's going to be boat full, sinking, then we're dead. And they were reacting based upon that. But Jesus wasn't reacting that way. In fact, I would say Jesus was acting the correct way. He was at rest. And the reason why I say this, that the storm is from the enemy, Jesus was acting correctly, is because then if that wasn't the case, then Jesus didn't have any right to rebuke the disciples for their lack of faith, right? If the disciples were acting correctly, then Jesus would not have rebuked them, right? If your child is doing what they're supposed to do, do you just fling open their bedroom door and start correcting them? No. They're doing what they're supposed to do at school, right? Your teachers don't correct you for doing what you're supposed to do. They correct you when you're not doing what you're supposed to do. So in this story, the storm was from the enemy. Jesus rebuked it. And then he corrected the disciples. And it wasn't necessarily the problem that they woke him up. I don't necessarily think it was that they woke Jesus up. I don't think he was bummed out because he was having a really good dream and they disturbed his sleep. I think it was the phrase that followed, carest thou not that we perish? Don't you care that we're dying? It wasn't that they woke him up. They could have woke him up and said, hey, Jesus, sorry to bother you. There's a storm. What should we do? I think they would have had a whole different response from Jesus, but... It wasn't that. They questioned his character. They questioned his love. They're like, Jesus, don't you care about me? I'm dying here. That's what the storm was promising, right? That's what the situation was telling them. Now let's look at that in our own life. What's the doctor's report telling you? What's the economy telling you? What's culture telling you? What's this Christmas season telling you? Is it the storm speaking and telling you these bad things, right? Are you maybe spending too much time looking at the news? I, I come here in the morning and the landlord or the owner of the funeral home has a... Um, a Wi-Fi that you can log on to, but it's kind of set up like the hotels where you have to use a password, then it brings you to this home screen, and then you click on sign in as a guest, and then it brings you to like a, a website. Uh, and it, it brings me to like some, like MSN or some kind of site, or um, it really doesn't matter. But it's some news page. That's the landing page after I sign in. That laptop that the kids use and the laptop that I use. And I dread, that's like the one thing I dread coming to church because that landing page is full of the news. And there is not one, I mean, there might be one good article, but the rest of it, it is such a satanic agenda. It's all fear. It's all um, tearing down this person and talking about how great this this is and it's not. I mean, really, what's so great about the culture of America that we should be drawn to it? What's working within America's culture that we should parade it around? Really? Why, why is this like supposed to be the authority in our lives? Why should we take cues as believers living in the kingdom of God from the kingdom of darkness? You realize that we live in two kingdoms, or we don't. You live in one kingdom or the other. You're born into sin. You are a sinner. Your sin doesn't make you a sinner. You're born a sinner. You're born into sin, Romans 5. Just how it is. Because of what Adam did, all are born into sin. You're born into the kingdom of darkness. And at some point, you've made the decision to bring Jesus into your life, to call upon him, make him Lord, and you've been translated, as Ephesians 2 says, or collage, one of those, it translated, sorry, 
uh, translated out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his dear son. So we're in a whole different kingdom. Be like, why would we let Australia tell America what to do? We wouldn't. And please pray for Australia. You cannot go to the grocery store and buy food if you don't have the vaccine in Australia. You can't go to work if you don't have the vaccine in Australia. You can't even get a haircut if you don't have the vaccine. Pray for Australia. Pray for these countries. Don't just shake your head and say, well, that devil's such a horrible devil. Pray for these people. You have brothers and sisters all over this world being a part of this kingdom. So, continuing on. They question his character. And then my third point is you... You, what you look at or what you give your attention to, you begin to value. What you give your attention to, you begin to value. I just had somebody talk to me this last week and they were talking about their spiritual walk and how sometimes it seems like it wanes a little bit. You know, you just, you don't feel that fervor and you're just not as excited and you don't feel the joy that you once had. And I really think part of that is because of what we've been focusing on because I go through that. And if I actually do a self-evaluation, I realize that what I've been looking at this last week or the last four days, the majority of it hasn't been the Word. It hasn't been centered around God. I've just have been living life in this world. I get caught up in, in life. You know, you could even be doing a good job of avoiding of avoiding the culture, of avoiding the news and all of these things that do drag you down. And you could still feel that same way because you have to be putting the Word of God in. You have to set your attention on things above. Colossians 3, chap chapter 3. Well, let's just look at it. should sometimes look at these verses. Um, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. I'm not saying that you have to go live in a cave to have revival fire burning in your heart. But what I'm saying is if you keep putting your attention on the wrong thing, whether it's the storm like with the disciples if it's the, just the world, it's news, it's entertainment, it's lifestyle. It's, it's intended to drag you down. And I know people say, well, it's just, you know, a little bit. It's just whatever. The world, there's some good people. I'm not denying that. But the fact is, is that in the kingdom of God, the father that we have is who? Who's our father? God, right? The one that sent his only begotten son. It was born December 25th. <laughs> I just saw this hilarious meme this morning. Anybody know somebody that's born on December 25th? Who, Alan? My dad. Your dad. Okay. So I always felt bad for people that are born on December 25th. I missed it by a month. So January 25th, in case you're wondering. <laughs> So, uh, but I have a family member that was born on December 25th, and it's like, you know, they had to have gotten robbed for presents, right, when it came to Christmas, because it's Christmas and your birthday. So here was the, the meme. It was the wise men, and they were in front of the manger with Jesus there, and they were giving the gifts, and they were saying, now this counts as both Christmas and his birthday, right? <laughs> <laughs> And if, I think Afton's going through it with the youth, we know that the, there wasn't three wise men, and they're actually magi, and they were kingmakers that would travel with large entourages. And they didn't go see Jesus when he was born, it was actually years after. 
And they didn't come giving him spices out of your mom's cupboard either. <laughs> this whole frankincense and myrrh, like Jesus is going to bake cookies or something. That's not, it was wealth, riches of, un, I mean, it was, it was wealth fit, fitting for a king. Fitting for a king. So, um, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, it says, If ye then be risen, or be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. That's why God's left-handed. <laughs> Who's left-handed in here? Where's my brothers and sisters? There we go. <laughs> Set your affection... Verse 2, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And in the Greek, or you might see it in the, the notes or the uh, center column of yours, if you have a cross-reference there with your Bible, mine says uh, mind. Set your mind on things above. Your mind. So your thought life, which takes place in your mind, should be on things above. I tell you what, you want to uh, start seeing the storm in a different light, start thinking on things above. Start seeing Jesus who sits at the right hand of God. And guess who's seated with Jesus? We are. We're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1. That's where you're seated. So you're above this. What is trying to tear you down What's trying to weigh you down and distract you? You're actually seated above it. That is beneath you. It is. But as long as you keep your mind on it, then you're going to begin to value it. Value what it's saying to you over what the Word of God says to you. Amen? And then the last thing I wanted to share with you this morning is kind of a new thought. If you turn to Mark chapter 7, so we were in Mark chapter 4. I want to share with you a new thought here in Mark chapter 7. I might not get through it all, but that's one of the nice things about a series is that we can pick it back up. Mark chapter 7. So if we go back to verse 1, the Pharisees are judging Jesus' disciples because they are eating bread with defiled people. They're not performing the hand-washing ceremonies that they uphold by their tradition. And you can see that in verses 1 through 5. And Jesus begins to talk to them. And what I want to get to is verse 13. Mark 7, verse 13. He said, You make the word of God of none effect through your traditions, which you have delivered, and many such things do ye. Or in the Amplified Classic, it says, You are nullifying and making void and of no effect the authority of the Word of God through your tradition. You know, people think, well, you know, how, God's sovereign. He can do anything He wants and He can, you know, make whatever He wants to make. He can do whatever He wants to do. And there is a lot of truth to that, right, for the sole nature, fact that He's God. But Jesus is saying to these Pharisees that you are canceling out the power of the word. You're nullifying, you're making void the authority of God's word by your tradition. I mean, look at how powerful God is, how powerful his word is. He spoke his word and created. 
what we have now, this earth. He spoke light be and light was. But Jesus is saying that by their tradition, they are canceling out the word. They're making it of no effect. The word doesn't have its effect in their lives that it's intended to because of tradition. This is huge, people. There's so many times we have questions about, well, why didn't this work? We prayed and this didn't happen. Why, why, why? This is one of the reasons. The Pharisees were making the word of God ineffectual, void, the revised version says, that you're making void the word of God by your tradition. So they're making it void by tradition. And I personally believe that is still true 2,000 years later in our lives. That there's a lot of things that we maybe don't understand to be tradition, but they are tradition that we've adopted and it makes the word of God of no effect. Because if it could do it then, when Jesus was physically standing in front of them, I believe it surely could happen now. Well, for example, there's, I've, I've heard this before. There's churches that say, well, you know, miracles have been done away with. We don't have miracles in our church because miracles went away with the apostles. That's right. That's right. We have miracles in our church because we believe in miracles. But if your traditions tell you that miracles don't happen, would you not then make the word of God of no effect when it comes to miracles? There's whole denominations that are against the filling of the Holy Spirit. And yet, and nobody's filled. Well, you wonder why. Because it's their tradition. And there's denominations that believe in it. We believe in it. And we're filled with the Holy Spirit. So, I'm not saying this to add any more separation in the body. We've got more than we should have ever taken on. We need to be more unified in the body of Christ. We need to get over our denominational differences. Um, I really believe that's going to see, we will see that more and more in these last days. They won't get hung up on the fact that they go across the street to this church versus that church. Jesus said that the world will know that you are one. They'll know that you are of me by your love one for another. And that's not just our love here in this room on a Sunday morning. It's our love as the body of Christ loving one another. But the point I want to make is you and I can't afford to go into 2022 stuck in a storm. I don't want to see us going into 2022 dealing with what we've been dealing with, not only just in our personal lives, um, but then as a whole in our nation. Again, like I said, there's this pressure to conform to this new norm. And it's seeped its way into the body of Christ. And I don't ever see in the Bible where there is a disclaimer or an exception made for when you're in a pandemic, then it's okay to act this way. You know, if you're in a pandemic, then, you know, Colossians 3, 2, you don't have to set your mind the whole time on things above because you're in a pandemic. You know, if you can hit at least half of that, that'd be great. Is that in there? No. No, it's not. Jesus is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus in this pandemic is still sleeping on a pillow on the back of the boat. It's not moving him. COVID is not rattling heaven. It's not shaking the foundations loose. It's, it's, it's not a spreading. Right? Or whatever it is. 
whatever it is in your life. So here's what I want to point out with tradition. Because I know when we look at tradition, we think of religion, right? But there was a tradition, I believe, that was on the scene that day during the storm. So a tradition in the Greek is a transmission of a precept. It's a transmission or it's transmitting a precept. That's tradition. It's sending or conveying from one person to another, usually from an authority figure to a subordinate, a general rule of action. That's a precept. It's not necessarily law, like a speed limit is 65. It's in this situation, this is what you do. Because that's what dad did. That's what granddad did. And that's what great granddad did. That's a precept. It's a rule or a general rule of action that is given from an authority that's transmitted down to us. So like our young people in school and college, they're receiving transmissions all the time. Not necessarily just the educational aspect, but just even the, the thoughts of, in this situation, this is what you do. They received them in their home life like you and I did growing up. And I think these fishermen disciples, some of them were fishermen, as you know, they had these traditions. If it's a storm of this magnitude and you're stuck, you die. That's the tradition. Right? If you're a professional fisherman, and I know like some of you like to go fishing, but I mean this was their vocation. They caught fish, then they sold the fish, then they went and caught more. Then you were... I think there's some similar aspects to a farmer where you can look at the, the clouds and the sky and you can remember what you had yesterday and you can know what time of year it is and you can almost predict better than Phil Shrek what the weather's going to be today. I, I was thinking this earlier. You know, I wish... What, wouldn't it be just great if the weathermen would just take their smartphone and just read off the weather app? They'd be right more than they would be wrong. I don't know. Just a thought. <laughs> Just. Anyways, um, my point is, is we have this tradition handed down to us. Tradition. This precept. Decade after decade. Jesus was addressing it with the Pharisees and their tradition. But I think that was on the scene with the disciples. And I think we allow ourselves to be programmed by these traditions, by what we allow into our lives. Let me just take this for example. If you're watching movie after movie after movie and TV show after TV show, especially you know some of the more medical-based TV shows, and, and you're seeing that every time somebody gets cancer, they die. In, in, the, in the culture, in the movies, in the entertainment. Cancer, death, cancer, death, cancer, death. Every time, cancer, death. How'd they die? Oh, cancer. Cancer, death. Cancer equals death. If you get cancer, you die. That's a precept. That's what a precept is. If you get cancer, then you prepare to die. And so then you get a diagnosis from the doctor that you get cancer. That tradition, cancer equals death, can nullify the word which is by Jesus stripes you were healed in your life. That's why it's important that we watch what we watch, that we're careful what we let in because the world has all of these traditions that they're trying to implant into our lives. Their limitations. 
their limitations. Look at what Jesus did in his ministry. He did things that defied the traditions. He walked on water. That doesn't make sense. There were more than once where a crowd would be pressing in on him to get rid of him and throw him off a cliff and he just would disappear. He'd walk through the crowd. That doesn't make sense. He spoke to the wind and spoke to the waves here in Mark 4. That defies tradition. But he lived in a supernatural or on a supernatural level that we actually are called to live. John chapter 14, greater things will you do than what he did. And that was Jesus promising it. I think it's Galatians 5.1 in the message it says, in, in, the, in the King James it says, be ye imitators of God. In the message it says, watch what God does and then do it. And it's going to be very difficult to live that kind of supernatural based life if you are so programmed with the world's traditions with these precepts. And I'm not saying this in a condemning way. But even look at age. You know, you get over 40, this is what's going to happen. You get over 30, this, you can expect this to happen. You know, your metabolism is going to slow down. You're going to start, you know, gaining weight just by looking at food from now on. <laughs> right? That's what it is. And we accept these traditions and I'm asking you to look at Jesus today. I'm asking you to consider that these traditions may seem innocent and that's probably why we've accepted them but they nullify God's power his authority from working in your life like it's intended. Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. God's word is still powerful. His word can still calm the storm. But if you're going to be panicked because of the traditions, what are you nullifying then in your life, in my life? What am I nullifying? So we need to get out from under this fear, this pressure that's trying to get us to throw our hands in the air and give up. We need to recognize the storm for what it is. It's not from God. Whatever that storm is in your life. We need to learn how to speak to that storm. You know, Jesus didn't just go out and rebuke the whole storm. He spoke to the wind that was causing the problem and then was more in a peaceable manner with the waves and told them to be calm. Be calm. You know, if your storm is a person or people, the Word of God says that we don't war against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. So it's a spiritual battle. So I don't actually have to battle that physical person and if I'm speaking against them, then I'm speaking to the wrong part of the storm. I need to speak to the demonic forces. I need to speak to the spiritual side of it. And I need to have the wisdom to do so. Because all of this fighting with that person physically, how, where has that gotten you? Has that fixed it? Is the storm over? Problem solved? In my experience, it actually just makes it worse. It hurts the relationship even more. So we need to know what to speak to using the authority that God has given us and speak to the correct thing. That's part of the problem too. And we cannot allow our traditions to tell us the outcome. Let me just share with this with you in closing. So, a lot of you recognize that this past summer was a pretty dry summer, not a lot of rain. And we got a, a few farmers in the room, and uh, I farm with my dad, 
And what's the tradition? Well, if you don't get rain, especially rain at these times, then this is what your crop's going to be. But I want to see the supernatural. In fact, I know that's why some of you are even in church, in this church, because you want to see God move. You want to see the supernatural. You believe that it's still for today. And I believe that with you. And so there was all kinds of doubt waging against my mind that it's dry, the crops are going to be bad. Thank God for crop insurance. And I'm not saying this to exalt myself. This is to exalt who God is and what he wants to do. And the crops, you know, I'm thankful for good crops. I don't depend on it, though, as much as like my dad and others do. And so even things that necess aren't necessarily vitally important to me, God still cares about And so when I would, I spent a few times there jogging, need to get back at that. And so I'd jog past the field, the corn field and the bean field, and I would just speak to them. I would say, you're going to be the best crops. You're going to, you, you are going to thrive. You're not going to die. And I would believe God for the rains and even if the rains phys physically didn't come I believe that they were going to be strong enough to hold out or even be watered somehow supernaturally but it didn't matter about the circumstances on the outside or the physical storm that was in my face I just began to trust God and speak to these things And then season's over, the combines come in the field and take out the crop and the field across the road that isn't mine, um, actually the soil, the nutrients are much higher than my field. The composition of the soil is much better than mine. And that field across that isn't mine underperformed even with the nutrient level that it had because of the drought. And mine overperformed. Hallelujah is right. That's God. That's God. That's God. And he cares about your business. He cares about your kids. He cares about it all. He cares about your heart. He even said, Jesus, when he came... Um, and read where it was written in Luke chapter 4. He says, I am anointed by God to heal the brokenhearted. There's a lot of brokenness in this room on varying levels. And we kind of sweep that under the rug and put on this facade of being a good Christian and I've got it together. But God is interested in the very intimate part of your life that no man can fix, that you can't fix, because if you could have, you would have, but he can. And I really believe that's where it starts, folks. I can give you a bunch of good advice. I can give you a bunch of good scriptures, but ultimately, it's going to have to start with you and him and allowing him access to your life so he can begin to heal those things because no amount of money is going to fix what's broken in your life. So many of us live with this belief, well, when I get to here, it'll be better. When I get to this, then it will be okay. And it never is. Because if you're not happy with where you're at now, you won't be happy when you get there. It's true. I'm saying that because I know that, because I've lived that. 
If you aren't happy with where you are now, you will not be happy when you get where you think you need to get to be happy. You may be happy for three hours and that's it. And then you'll be right back to where you were. So it's not a new car, it's not a new house, it's not a new spouse. It's something that he wants to fix and heal in you. And what better season to allow him to do that? The season where he showed and proved once and for all how much he loves you. There shouldn't be any doubt of the love of the Father for you. And he was willing to sacrifice his greatest, most valuable possession, his son, for you and for me. Let me pray with you this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, I know it's not by accident that those here are here. And I believe, Lord, that you've been speaking to them this morning. Lord, I believe that there's no greater season for us to be in than we are right now. Regardless of the storm that we're facing, my request this morning, God, is that we would get a revelation of your love. That we would become a people that would be willing to trust you with our hearts. That would give you full, complete, and total access to our lives. To do what you want to do. To make us whole to make us the people that you have destined for us to be. Lord, that we would begin to rest in you. That we wouldn't get weighed down, burdened down with the fear and the worry and the storm, but God, we would see who you are and who you made us to be and we'd find rest in the storm. For some of us, God, that you would enlighten us to know what to say, what to speak to the storm, to use our words and our authority. And at the end of it, God, that we would just simply cast our care, whether it's a relationship, whether it's our physical well-being, whether it's our finances, our occupation, God. Because ultimately... It's going to take a miracle. Ultimately, God, it's, it's, we, we have to have you. And how you do it and what you do it like and when you do it, God, that's you. And that's, we're going to leave that in your capable hands. Jesus, when you said to the disciples, let's go over to the other side, you spoke the word like you spoke the word to our hearts today. And our job is to just simply trust you. To, to know that when you say something, you mean it. Others have broken their word. They've broken their promises, God, but you don't. You are a father that we can trust. And this morning, we give you our heart. Would you repeat this after me? Jesus, I give you full access to my heart to do what you've always wanted to do in me today. Thank you for healing me inside and out. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to Victory Life Church. We hope this message blessed you today. If it did, or if you have any questions, please contact us at info at victorysouthdakota.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you and God bless.